I bet you that the There'll Israel people, th yeah, there's going to be this, this celebration sponsored by the money of the Jewish people c claiming this peace exactly as we're saying. This is just, I'm just looking at that. I'm not trying to make doctrine here. But you can see everything so far has followed the same pattern. It's going to happen the same way. And then it says here, uh, they, then they arose early in the morning, swore an oath with one another, and Isaac sent them away, and they departed in peace. And that is what is going to happen. Israel is going to send these people away in peace. They're going to give away half of Jerusalem, which is already prophesied. It's going to happen. Half of the city is going to go into, into bondage or whatever it says. And they're going to give away all the goods, and they're going to make the peace. They're going to throw the banquet, and everything is going to be at the expense of the Jews, but in the end, these people are going to come right back around and bite them in the tail. Yeah. Go ahead. Charlie, yes. Where, where, is, where is it in prophecy that Jerusalem will be split? We're going to go to Zechariah, and uh, I'm going to repeat that while I'm looking. No, no, we're going to find it real quickly. Um, I was asked just for Rory, who's listening, he may not have heard your question, where is it? prophesied that uh, Israel will be, um, I'm sorry, Jerusalem would be divided in half again. And it's probably I, uh, Zechariah 10. It might not be. We're going to find out here real quickly. It's been a while since I looked in this. So um, uh, somewhere between 10 and 14. Let's see, 12. Okay. Um, it's probably 12. It's not 10. It says... Um, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they leave siege against Judah and Jerusalem, which is exactly what's been happening. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples who would uh, heave it away, uh, will surely cut it in pieces, though all the nations of the earth are gathered against it. That's exactly what is happening right now. The whole world is gathered against Jerusalem. That's... Um, well, I, I haven't found the, the reference for you. I'm just reading what's going on right now. But here we're going to go to, um, I, I still have to find this. Um, oh, 14, here it is. 14.1, Behold, the day of the, the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Half of the city is going to go under the hands of the Muslims. And that's already prophesied. What's that? You know what? It, it, I don't. Well, it's being taken from them either way. What I'm saying is, if they give it to them, it is still by force. It could be part of the treaty, and they're going to give it up as part of the treaty. But it is still being forced by them. And that's why I say Barack Obama is forcing them. Our State Department is forcing them. So whether it happens by a actual battle or whether it happens by this treaty, it is still being forced. Their hand is being forced. And that's why I say it doesn't matter which way it occurs. It will occur. And half of the city, East Jerusalem, which is what they want, is going to go to the Jews. No doubt about it. If we see that coming, actually the Jews say we're going to give up East Jerusalem. Wow, as Jesus said, lift your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. I mean, we are, oh, we're so close. We're so close. What's that? Zechariah 14, 1 and 2. Yeah, that's where that is. All right, Ken, go ahead. Thirty-three, I think. What's it? Um, no, it's thirty-two. Thirty-two. That day, Isaac's servants came and told him the well they had told him about the well they had dug. Okay, here's another parallel. I'm just trying to make parallels. I'm not asking you to believe this. This is just something. Imagine this. Just imagine how funny this would be. They make peace with Israel. Israel says, we are going to give you this part. And we're going to give you, you know, they're going to make little land exchanges and say, this city is yours and this one. Imagine the day after signing the treaty, something that they gave up for the Israels and Israels gave them something in exchange. They find zillions of gallons of oil. Do you know what I'm saying? Here, the next day after this treaty, he finds a well. He digs a well and there's water there, right? Imagine that happening again. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I'm trying to say that what has happened through the verses we've been reading today have all paralleled what's going on in the world today. And wouldn't it just tickle you to death yeah. to have the Jewish people say, all right, we're going to do this, and they start their land thing, they make the, the covenant, because it's going to happen. I, you know, whether we force it now or whether it happens a thousand years from now, it is going to happen. The Bible says it's going to happen. But isn't it? funny to think that maybe they will find this huge repository of oil or of natural gas or a zillion dollars worth of diamonds or gold or something in the ground that belongs to them that didn't belong to them 30 seconds before. Oh, I just would make me so happy. Oh, 
And, you know, uh, that would give all the reason in the world for them to come against them. You know, so, oh, oh, I'm just so excited because I never thought of this until right now, but they would just tickle me to death. Go ahead, please. 33. He called it Sheba, and to this, uh, we found water, he called it Sheba, and to this day, the name of the town has been Beersheba. When Esau was 40 years old, am I in the right place? Yes, yeah. absolutely. When Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, daughter of Beri the Hittite, and also Basemath, daughter of Elon the Hittite. They were a source of grief to Isaac and Rebekah. Okay, a little bit to unpackage here. We have um, uh, Sheba, as I said, means the well of the seven or the well of the oath. And as you said, he took, um, where was it, up here a little earlier, swore an oath, okay? And um, I, certainly he took seven sheep, just like his father did, but it doesn't say that there. And then, um, just so you know, the daughter, the name Basemath, the daughter of, uh, of uh, Esau, Basemath is still a very common name that you'll see in Muslim circles today. Just so you know that. Um, when Esau was 40 years old, this is the son of Isaac, the firstborn, but not the, uh, you know, not the one that receives the blessing. And he married two daughters of the Hittites, which are the, the, the people of Heth, the people that are the Canaanites. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not the people that, the, cursed by Noah. Thank you. And um, so they're not the people that they should be marrying with. All right, and they're a source of grief uh, of mine to Isaac and Rebekah. So all of a sudden, we're going through all this account of Isaac, and all of a sudden we insert Esau. And so that tells us that this is going to be the next thing that is going to play out. You just have to kind of look for the little clues that new things are coming. And that chapter 27 is going to explain why that particular verse was brought in. Go ahead. Anybody, somebody else can, been reading for a whole chapter? came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see <coughs> that he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son. And he answered him, Here I am. <coughs> and he said, Behold, now I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Okay, he doesn't know the day of his death, but he thinks it's coming pretty soon, right? And so he's going to bless him before he dies to make sure that uh, the blessing is passed on. How much longer does Isaac live? A long time, because Israel, Jacob, goes up to Patamaran, spends many, many years, 20 years or so, comes back and is part of the burial of his father Isaac. So, I mean, the guy lived a lot longer. But when I read that particular account, after having thought about how many years he laid there, he's laying in his bed, unable to work, right? He's blind. Can you imagine laying there for 25 or so years? I, it just, I, that's what comes to mind when I read that, is that he thinks he's about to kick off because he's in already in bad shape. And here, look, he's going all these years. Imagine that. All right, go ahead. What? I hadn't thought of that. Well, I had. That's why we're having a Bible class. And if you think of something I don't mention, please mention it back to me. <laughs> I love anybody else that says that I'd be kind to, but my mom I won't. <laughs> Oh, goodness. <laughs> Verse 3, go ahead. Now, therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, and go out into the field to hunt game for me, and make me savory food, which I love, and bring, me, bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Okay, so he wants that yummy food, and he's, he's uh, that's, how do you get, how do you get your children to do anything? Promise them something, and in the meantime, you promise them that something after you get something really good. So he wants that yummy food, and so he's doing it. What does a um, quiver and arrows also signify in the Bible? Does anybody know anything else where it... Children. Absolutely. Let's see if we can find that real quickly here. It's in the later Psalms. It's in the Psalms of Ascents, and it's probably about 135 or 134 we're going to see here. Uh, let's see here. It's a song of ascent, and uh, I just want to read it to you just so you have a little something to think about when you read this um, uh, song of ascent. Furrows in their sheaves. Let's see here. 
It's uh, children are a heritage from the Lord. Oh, here it is right here. It's Psalm 127. It says, behold, verse 3, behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has a quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. So just so you see a little parallel there in the Bible that a quiver and arrows are like numerous children. It's a blessing from the Lord. Okay? So, uh, and the Catholics really, really take that one and run with it. <laughs> I'm kidding. All right. Yeah. yeah missionaries. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, all right, please go ahead and uh, where were we? Verse four. And make the savory food which I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau his son, and Esau went to the field and to hunt game and bring it. And Rebekah spoke to Jacob her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau your brother, saying, Bring me game and make savory food for me, that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of my Lord before my death. Keep going? Oh, yeah. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Go now into the, to the flock and bring me from there two choice kids of the goats. And I will make savory food from them for your father, such as he loved. Okay, so you see that she... You, uh, the reason why I didn't stop you is because we all know this story, and he, she's just repeating what her father had said to uh, Esau. You know what I forgot to do? Is anybody hot? I forgot to turn on the air. Give me just a second here. I'm sorry about that. I completely forgot. No, no, I'll get it for you. Hang on one sec. And I might just leave that in there so that Rory gets to hear me running down the hall and running back and breathing real heavy and all that. Anyway, um, so that's, that's why I didn't stop you in that particular context. Are you leaving, Dave? Oh, okay. Oh, sorry about that. All right, well, have a great one. And uh, anybody else, Ken, you want to go back and start reading? Or anybody else want to read from uh, verse 6? Or whatever. No, we were 10. I'm sorry, 10. Yep. Then take it to your father to eat so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, But my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am a man with smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him, and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. Okay, real quickly before we go on, I want to say something about verse 11. It says, If you take out the words that are inserted by the translators, this is how it would read. And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Look, Esau, my brother, a hairy man, and I a smooth man. So... Anyway, it's just, it's, it, it, they insert words for our understanding, but it's just kind of funny to say I'm a smooth man. Uh, anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in for a little fun. All right, so um, he's afraid that he's going to get cursed instead of blessed. All right, but we already know because when they were fighting in the womb that the older will serve the younger, okay, and the blessing will come through him. And she knows that. She, she, there's no doubt that she remembered that. When she went to inquire of the Lord, does everybody here remember that? Do you want to go back real quick? You all remember that. Um, uh, is that she knew this, and that maybe that's why she favored the son. Is because she knew that he'd be the son of blessing, or maybe it's because he was, you know, had the better temperament. Whatever reason, but he's smooth. He's a smooth operator, and she knew he'd be a smooth operator. They like that, okay? So, anyway, in verse 13, what does she say? His mother said to him, my son, let, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say. Go and get them. Okay. Now, I'm going to preempt what we're going to read here because I may forget to bring this up, but the curse was on her because she is never mentioned again in the Bible after he departs. And we can assume, we can't insert this into the Bible, but we can assume that she died before he returned uh, back from his exile, the land of his exile, okay? She's not mentioned again in there. And so, you know, it, whatever. I don't want to make doctrine of that. You know, people will insert things that aren't in there, but I am assuming because of that, that that she probably died long before he returned. And the father still alive all those years later. But anyway, go ahead. 
So he went and got them and brought them to his mother. And she prepared some tasty food just the way his father liked it. I really like that translation rather than the, that mine says savory, his said savory, but I love the way the NIV says tasty.